The role of composers. I think, above all, you have to remain true to yourself and whatever you choose to write about, you have to find something that really turns you on and hopefully then it can reach other people because of course we're all human beings so the basic human truths that can reach to other people I feel that very strongly so even though I write about Harriet and that world is very strange to me about Bolivar whose world I've, I, I have been to South America but nevertheless the world 200 years before is not familiar to me and I'm not, even though I wrote about Mary Queen of Scots, and I think I'm the right person to write about that. I'm a woman, I was educated in France, but I'm a Scot. You know, a very few people, and a composer of course, very few people can have all those criteria. Nevertheless, what was her world really like? You, 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 you try to imagine what it must have felt like faced with the things that you know she had to face. And while I was writing the libretto, I remember saying to myself, no, I said to her, Mary, don't marry Bothwell, can't you see? That's a really, really stupid thing to do. Well, of course she didn't listen to my advice. <laughs> and you, we all know what happened. <laughs> but Purcell, Handel, even, even the beginning of Romanticism with Beethoven, they knew who they were writing for. And as time has gone on, and I think that... Um, maybe Darmstadt, it started to really become a um, egocentric activity that ignored what was happening in the world um, and who composers were writing for. Would you well, agree with that? Well, egocentric. I think you have to write for yourself without it sounding totally obnoxious because <laughs> That you know where you are and what your feelings are about things. I mean, if you write without empathy, that's something else. But I think you have to write from yourself because that's what you know about. And hopefully through that, it can reach other people. So do you have an empathy? I mean, even for Mary, she went and married Bothwell, she, you know, whatever. And what happened to her and why, you can, you can feel that even though there's no way I'm a queen, and certainly not from several hundred years ago. But, you know, the human feeling is constant, must be. And so you, egocentric in that sense, yes, you have to be, because that's, that's what's true. History and revolutionary characters have fascinated you, both, yes. both through opera and... But, and and why writing. are they revolutionary? You know, what was Bolivar doing? Well, talk a bit about how these people attracted you to write about them. What was it about them that... That's difficult to put in a few words. Bolivar, what did he try to do? He wanted to free South America from the Spanish rule and create a United, a United States of South America. I mean, <laughs> a big deal. And then you see how he got embroiled with his generals to make this possible. There was Pius in Venezuela, who was really, as I saw, a kind of guerrilla fighter. And then Bolivar took his people to Colombia and eventually met up with Santander, very different kettle of fish. He was an elegant man and a lawyer and educated and not really a soul well I, I don't I don't know maybe he was a soldier but I mean he was an administrator so there you have two very different type of generals then you have the young Sucre and who was an important general in, in later on and then you have Manuela of course you have to have a woman <laughs> He met, Bolivar met Manuela in Quito. She actually lived in Lima, but she happened to be in Quito and there was a ball there. And he, I had her, I don't know if this is true, but he, I had her see him see her and was immediately attracted. 
and all his people said to him, you can't do that, she's a married woman, this would be very shocking. Well, of course, he didn't listen to that. And they had a big affair. Her husband was, a, I think, a British businessman and perhaps a little boring. Anyway, eventually in Lima, and things seemed to be going quite well, and the Spanish were really defeated. But then he had, Bolivar felt he had to go back to Bogota in Colombia. And suddenly you see Manuela receiving a letter from him saying, I'm really, I'm really ill and I need you, please come. Meanwhile, Santander and Pius, his two generals, had quarreled because Pius didn't want to knuckle down to Santander. Why should Venezuela knuckle down to Colombia? It was called Gran Colombia in those days. So that was awkward and Bolivar is trying to uh, negotiate between these two men. And there's a big scene between Santander and Bolivar and finally bon Bolivar said, I am just going to do what I think is right and Santander says you have become a dictator and sets up an assassination attempt. Meanwhile Manuela has arrived having heard from Bolivar this letter that he's sick. Very operatic, I don't quite know, I forget what it was. And she is the one that saves Bolivar from the assassination attempt. And then something very interesting happened. The assassination attempt happens and Manuela is at the door and says to the people coming, I'm, I'm not dressed yet, please just wait a moment. And says to Bolivar, jump out of the window. And so that's what happened, so he is saved. <laughs> One of the stage directors that was going to do this said, you can't just have the guy jumping out of the window. <laughs> and my friend, I had written the libretto in English and she had done the Spanish version. She said, you cannot change that. That is something that is so well known all over South America. Bolivar jumped out of the window. You cannot change that to something more interesting. <laughs> so that's why Bolivar jumps out of the window, which sounds very tame, a tame kind of thing to do, but you know. It's one of these events that was too well known. So these, these three women, these three powerful and strong women that, that you wrote the, uh, the... Oh, the, Harriet the, and Mary and Manuela. Correct. Yes. I love them all. Very different women. Why did you put them into one voice in three women? In one this? voice? They're all sopranos. But why not use three separate voices? Was it purely practical? Mm -hmm. a, a different operas, it's a different kind of voice. No, in, in the concert piece, Thea. Oh, the concert piece is called Three Women. Yes. Uh, well, because they were sopranos. They were all sopranos in the original opera and I used the original arias from the operas in this work. It's Three Women is not a kind of new work. It's just no. taken from from the three operas and I put in a narrator just to link it and to describe the, the, the three women who they were. And it's quite interesting also how it was done. For Mary, she had a, a crown and an elegant cloak and so she looked regal because it was that part of the story. When Manuela came, she takes off the cloak and takes off the crown, so she has a slinky dress on, sort of rather décolleté probably. Uh -huh. And then she becomes Harriet, she puts on another kind of cloak <laughs> and becomes a slave. So we had sort of minor costume change, you know, on stage. And the narrator comments on this and sets up each scene, so it's just, it's re they're really just excerpts from the three operas. Right. And it was, it, it was for purely practical reasons. Yeah, though. I didn't want to change the music because there, there it was. But in fact, the three women in the operas are very, are very different. I mean, they're a different kind of soprano. Mary is more dramatic, Manuela is perhaps more lyric. Um, you know, so there's, a, and also, uh, and Harriet would be a black singer. So Peter would have cast them very differently.
And that would have been difficult in the concert piece. Yeah, you have to have, have one person. Yeah. yeah. So the, the other thing I find fascinating about your music is the, the, the references to times past. You, you're a, a, a contemporary composer that is, that is embedded in the past. And, and two of the pieces that I love have references both to Sibelius and to Dvorak, and they were written for very specific reasons. Talk a bit about both of those works. I can't think about it. One was the Sibelius anniversary, where you quote the Fifth Symphony. I don't have anything think... interesting to say about that. All right, okay. I Forget love... that question. I love that, okay. All right. <laughs> think of another one. <laughs> so let's talk about Phoenix Rising. Do you want to talk about Phoenix I don't Rising? remember too much about that either, to tell you the truth. It was... Um, the first thing was just the title. The Phoenix has always interested me of, of, a, of a turning point in life where things seem totally hopeless and then something happens to change. So like the Phoenix comes out. And what happened, I was walking around the streets in Norfolk one day thinking about, I was just beginning the piece and there was a, a shop and it said the Phoenix rising. So there was my title. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, I was just thinking about the phoenix, but calling the phoenix rising, there it was. And then I could write the piece. And it's interesting, I need the title to write the piece. What is the dramatic import? I remember I had a, a note from, that I was going to have a commission, oh, to write something for the proms. And I was thinking, I said to Peter, who was standing there, uh, what do you think I should write? And he suddenly said, Loch Ness. Then I could write the piece. <laughs> I had it in a second. I mean, the idea in a second, not the writing of the piece. That took much longer. But just to have the idea, the dramatic idea, then I could write the piece. So stories and pictures are, are important. Whatever. It, 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 sometimes it's not even, it's what I call dramatic abstract. So the idea for the clarinet concerto, for instance, was, um, it was written for the wonderful clarinet player Gervais de Pire, who perhaps you knew, and who I'd worked with quite a bit when I was in London, and I suddenly thought concerto grosso, and that is that there are tutti passages and solo passages. So what happens in the concerto, it starts in a perfectly normal way, that the soloist comes on and stands at the conductor's left. And then I had him walk round the orchestra. So here's the orchestra and I'm the conductor, the soloist is here, then he walks through the either the second violins, if the, the violins are like this and this, to that section over there with the, with the brass um, and so on. And there's a kind of solo section there, which is led by the soloist, not by the conductor. The conductor is conducting the rest of the orchestra, but the soloist has a kind of section there, which he leads, not by conducting, but the by his cues. Then he, there's another tutti section and he moves over there and I brought in an accordion and with the horns and the uh, clarinets and so on. So there's a section over there again which is led by the soloist by cues and the conductor is conducting the rest of the orchestra and then there's a final section right on the conductor's left with the harp and the I think the flute comes in and percussion or something like that. Then he comes back to the beginning and there's a big tutti. So it's kind of like a concerto grosso. So there's no, there's no pictures or anything. It's just, it's a dramatic thing of a player moving and not being led entirely by the conductor that other people have the lead. And even in something like um, turbulent landscapes, which is based on pictures of Turner, for sure. 
but there are six movement. I think there are six movements, and in each each movement, there's a soloist from the orchestra who kind of depicts what's happening in the picture, and the soloist might is is like a soloist in the in a concerto. They stand up in place. They don't stand up beside the conductor. They stand up in place in the orchestra, and they have a more soloistic way of playing. Because I think when players stand, they play differently from when they're sitting. I mean, partly because they're visible, but also there's a certain freedom of movement. But then what's interesting, the guy who played the first solo in Turbulent Landscapes is the Sea Monsters, so it's a tuba player. Um, and I was not so much listening as watching him and for the rehearsal. And at the end of the rehearsal, I went up to him and I said, you played absolutely beautifully. However, I don't want you standing at the beginning of the movement. You need to be sitting. And then when the music starts, then you stand because then everybody will see you. If you are already standing, people may not notice. And simply when you've finished your solo and the orchestra has a few bars to finish, when you sit down, you don't start immediately putting your stand down to the normal height and adjusting that. You don't do that. You sit down and sort of wait. And when the next movement starts, then you adjust your stand. It's nothing to do with music, but it's to do with audience watching this player and him not understanding that they're watching him. It's a, an orchestral players are not always used to that. But I rather like that. And he got the picture immediately and, and was wonderful. I'm, I'm, I, I love composers conducting their own music because you don't have this intermediary of a conductor getting in between. Talk about your experiences as a, as a conductor. Well, the first thing I had a chance to conduct, I realized that I didn't know. So I had lessons from Jacques-Louis Monod in London before he came to the States and I remember it was just a chamber work I was conducting and I thought I'm going to get to the bottom of this. So he, I, was, I had the score there and he said, and he, had, he saw the score too and so I was, I was conducting in total silence, imagining the sounds and he said, I don't see the bassoon in your hand. You know, it's a chamber music piece, so I hadn't given a, you know, a little whatever for the bassoon to come in. I thought you really, you really have to be aware of everybody and, and how to make it work. So it was, I mean, of course he taught me more than just the bassoon coming in, but that was really wonderful. So I had my first chance to conduct really with just a chamber music group and it was very frightening then to go for the first time to an orchestra but it was also wonderful because I said to the, I didn't I'm not a great conductor I'm a composer who conducts and I could say to the players you know that's not working quite right what I really want is such and such they said well why don't you bow it this way or why don't you do this and I said let's do it and I could change the score you can't spend a lot of time doing that in rehearsal time, but you can do a little bit of that and you can talk to people in the break and so on and find, get their advice. So you get the advice from the orchestra of what really will sound. And once I remember I had a kind of section for the violas. So of course I said to my husband, how do you think this should be bowed? so it would work. So I kind of sang it to him and said, well, if you did this, and a very strange bowing, I said, are you sure? He said, yes, just leave it like that. It'll, it'll work fine. No questions. It just came out fine. It just absolutely worked. Nobody, no viola player came up and said, what's this strange bowing? It came out and it sounded absolutely right. Oh, and then something very funny happened. I wrote a kind of ad lib bit for the piccolo player. I wanted just a very quick rhythm just going on as a kind of sound. And so I left it ad lib. I said, this is sort of thing, just... <laughs> piccolo player came to me, the, or the flute player said, you know, I did, 
I was in the war, I had to do radio stuff in, in Morse, and it's very difficult for me not to actually make messages, <laughs> which is illegal. So I wish you had written out something. <laughs> so I said, here you are. <laughs> so you get into very unexpected places sometimes. Did, did conducting affect your writing? Did, did you learn anything through conducting? Yeah, of course. When I write an orchestra piece, I always kind of mentally put myself, not that I expect necessarily to conduct, but if I were the conductor, this is how it can be done. Not how it should be done, but how it can be done, so that there's always a way that's absolutely practical. Because I always said to my students, and I apply the same thing to myself, if you hear something that sounds easy, but is very difficult to play, that is a very bad thing. On the other hand, if you hear something that sounds incredibly difficult and is relatively easy to play for the orchestra, that's good. <laughs> and it also means ensemble of how you deal with sort of if there are little solos in the orchestra and, 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 and the tutties and so on and how they work and how they interchange. If they work, I mean, basically, I think when you write something, it should be basically sight readable by a professional orchestra. Then when you use the rehearsal, it's to clean up everything and to make sure everybody understands and so on and so on. Basically sight readable. Not all the notes, but just that the idea is sight readable. Did, did it affect your orchestration? Well, I learned. I, you're always learning. I'm still learning about stuff. You bet. Because your, your orchestration is wonderfully rich in places. Your use of the orchestra is fantastic. I love doing... Yeah, I love scoring. Also, what's interesting, I, I have done reductions from big orchestra down, like my operas from Mary Queen of Scots and Bolivar, down to 11, 12 players. I find that absolutely fascinating. I love doing that. And do you compose at the piano? Uh, not so much these days, because my ears are so bad. I compose a lot sitting at my desk. Right. So, so you hear the orchestration yeah, of as, course. as you're writing it? Well, you play a C major chord, and it's a C major chord. You can choose to hear it on three flutes or three clarinets or even three bassoons or whatever. And you hear the sound, of course. So you don't start in short score? And then, no. and then orchestra. No, the short score. Thought, thought. Well, yeah, short score. Yeah, I don't, I don't go right into a big full score, but I write in, in a short score, not a piano reduction, but a short score, knowing exactly what is what. And then comes the very exciting day when you put that into a proper full score, and then you have to adjust to make sure that every single individual player makes sense and and has has a line and and how it all works and how it joins and so on and so on yeah that's 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 the big day are you a fast writer some things are fast and some things are very slow just depends sometimes things happen and other times you fight for everything 